Hello, good evening, good morning, good afternoon, everybody. I am Bernard Royer. I am senior manager in the VMware data team. And I am here tonight to uh, talk about the new features of Green Plum 7. Green Plum 7 is a major release of Green Plum. And uh, we are going to give you a, a good idea of the, some new functionalities into Green Plum. So we have selected a, a few of them. And I'm here tonight with uh, Shaima, uh, who is pre-sales data engineer at VMware Data, and also with Ruxu, data scientist at VMware Data. So let's go to the uh, introduction to the agenda. So we are doing, going to do a, a quick introduction about Greenplum, just uh, to give you a, a quick recap of where we are and what is the product, if you are not completely aware of what is Greenplum. Then I will uh, pass the floor to, to Shaima and she will talk about uh, some security improvement that uh, we have uh, put into Greenplum 7. And then we are going to talk about uh, integration improvement, especially around foreign data wrapper. That will include also some demos. Then uh, Ruxu will take uh, the AI part. Uh, AI is a big part of Greenplum 7. There are some major new features into the product. And uh, she will also uh, do some demos that are going to show you uh, relatively quickly uh, what you can do with Green, Green Plum 7. And at the end of the presentation, we should have uh, some time for Q&A if you have any questions. So just a quick uh, recap about Green Plum. Uh, it's the uh, enterprise ready, the only enterprise ready MPP system based on Postgres. And it's really designed for analytics and now for Gen AI. So basically, Greenplum is a cluster of Postgres SQL instance, a Postgres SQL cluster that you can scale up and scale out. It's been on the market for a long time, now 20 years, and we are now at Greenplum 7. Uh, Really, the power of Postgres is everywhere, and uh, I, I don't think that uh, any of you don't knows. Everybody knows what is Postgres, and everybody has been using Postgres in his life. And when you put it together in a Green Plum cluster, the power of the, the combination of all these Postgres inst SQL instances is really amazing. So this is the architecture slide of Greenplum. Uh, and I guess that some of you have already seen that, that slide. But that gives you a, a very good idea of what you can do with uh, Greenplum. It's really a, a data platform. And it can scale from a few terabytes to multiple petabytes. So the backbone is really that Greenplum cluster made of several nodes uh, with a coordinator. Uh, the great thing with Greenplum is that you can scale up, of course, but you can also scale out, uh, and you can scale out really, really big. You know, if uh, you also uh, you can also extend your system with external connectors, so you can interconnect Greenplum with other systems like Hadoop or uh, cloud storage or some other databases where you can access in read-write mode all the data. Of course, uh, you can use ETL tools, ELT tools, uh, to put some data into Greenplum. You can also use some streaming engines like Kafka or RabbitMQ uh, to put data on the fly into your Greenplum installation. And uh, regarding the data type you can put into your Greenplum installation, it's pretty much any format. So we have been uh, uh, working for a long, long time with structured and semi-structured data. Uh, but now we can also store unstructured data into Greenplum using the PG vector modules and converting unstructured data into embeddings. Uh, Ruxi will talk you uh, will uh, show you what you can do with embeddings a bit later in the presentation. Of course, putting data into a Greenplum system is fantastic, but if you can't do anything, this is useless. Uh, the good thing is that with Greenplum, because this is based on Postgres, you can interconnect with a lot of different tools like Tableau or whatever reporting or visualization tool like Click, Tipco, everything pretty much. So you can give access to all your data, to all your users, whoever they are, that can be business user, data analysts, IT professionals just want to have a, a, a report of a or a dashboard. But also, you can give access to the data to your 
data scientists people who are going to make the most of your data and use all their varied tools like Jupyter, R, Python, uh, and do whatever they want with the data. So just to make it short, PM Working Perm is really the unified platform for BI and AI. And really the goal of Green Plum is to transform all your data uh, into really actionable insight at any scale. So now I pass the floor to Shaima, who is going to talk to you about uh, the new features into Green Plum 7. Shaima, it's you. Thank you, Bernard. Thanks a lot. So as Bernard mentioned, we are using Postgres in Green Plum, and thanks to that, in Green Plum 7, we'll be integrating plenty of new features from Postgres 9.5 to Postgres uh, 12. And we will include all the improvements that have been already integrated in, in Postgres. Some of the key uh, features and improvements in uh, Green Plum 7 have been summarized in this uh, slide. So we'll be benefiting from modern Postgres capabilities. Um, there will be plenty of enterprise improvements around manageability, security, performance, and integration. And the last bit is about AI and ML, new capabilities and improvements. And in today's talk, we'll be focusing mainly on this part, security, integration, AI and, AI and ML. So let's start with the first bit, what has been improved in security. One of the new features that we have in Green Plum 7 is the row level security. Uh, so this is a nice way to give you more uh, ability to uh, add security at a granular level on your uh, tables on the row level. So you can say which rows are accessible to which user and on which um, rules that you define. So this can be used through uh, this policy logic. You can create one or more policies on your table. And those can be assigned for different operations that you have typically in SQL, for example, like select, insert, update, or delete. You can assign those to a group of users, to a user uh, uh, in particular and you can define the condition so this has to be a, a boolean expression uh, any sql conditional expression will do and this will be um, the uh, expression used to filter the rows to which you have access so if the uh, rule returns true it will be visible to the user and if for certain operations like, like inserts and updates you can also define the conditions for the new rows that you will be adding uh, to your table. And by default, they will be the same as the expression in music. There are two different uh, types of policies, permissive ones and restrictive ones. And you can accumulate different uh, policies for uh, a certain uh, table. The permissive ones will be uh, applied using the OR operator and the restrictive one will be applied using the AND operator. And for a restrictive rule to be uh, able to be applied properly, you will have to have a permissive uh, rule on that uh, operation that is already defined. So let's see this uh, through some examples that will be maybe uh, easier to understand. So here I have a simple example, I have table with some employees and the department of each employee. And I have two users and we are assuming each time I'm talking about users that they, they will be connected to the green plant system. Let me start by creating one policy. So this policy uh, will give my uh, connected user the ability to act on uh, on their own row so they can access their row and they can modify their row so for example if there, if there is a typo the user can change their row and they can access the row as well so here for example pam when she's connected she will see her row michael will see his only now let's say the manager needs to have access to all the information that is in this table, then for that we have to create another policy 
using true and to assign it to the user Michael. This is a very simple uh, policy, and then Michael will have access to all the roles in, in the table. This is the first example. Let's see another one. Here, mainly my purpose is just to show permissive versus restricted and how this is uh, applied in practice. I have same data, I have user fan. I will be creating a permissive role by default, uh, the policies are permissive. And here I'm saying, you know, you can see any, any role in the table. You can do select on anything. I'm using the condition true. So Pam can select everything. Now I'm adding another permissive uh, rule. Here I'm saying that Pam should be able to do other operations on her roles. So she can do update or delete, for example. This will be translated, like the combination of the two rules will be translated like so. So remember earlier we talked about permissive uh, rules using the OR operator. So here we are basically saying that I'm doing an OR between the two possibilities. And as a result, Pam can do select on all rows and then she can also do select, insert, update, delete on rows where her username equals Pam. Let's remove this rule and then create the same one, same condition using a restrictive mode. So in here, when we do a restrictive mode, we are restricting the access. And as a result, here the user will only be able to do the select on her uh, statement because I have only one permissive policy that was defined for select, nothing for the other operations, which basically translates to using this rule so select on all rows and select insert update etc on rows where my username equal pam and in this case it will result in only being able to select on her rows so this is another simple example now i have another example and i will try to show you how this looks like on, on sql level I have a table with some sales leads, name of the company, the type of the lead source, and I'm creating four policies that will be combined. The first one will be used to allow um, users to select on the table. So this is a permissive rule. Then I will add to that a rule for non-sales people. They will be able to see any data where the amount of the sales lead is uh, less than 5,000. So this is the syntax that we will use. I'll create another restrictive rule and here it will be associated to the sales people and they will be able to only see data where the estimated amount of the lead is uh, less than 5,000, but they can also see any lead that comes from a referral. And then the manager should have all access. So this is the last rule that I am creating. Let's connect to our Green Plan database. I'll be sharing my SQL. So here, I'm just using PSQL, pretty easy. I'm double checking that I have the same policies which I saw on the, on the slides that are defined. So I have four policies on my sales lead table. Uh, if I'm like super user of Green Plan, I have uh, by default way uh, the right to bypass any, any rules. So I should see uh, all the data in my uh, table. There are 10 rules. So first thing I'll connect as Pam, who is not a salesperson. So Pam will only see the rules when uh, the estimated amount is less or equal 5,000. I'll connect as Jim, who is a sales guy, so he should be able to see the same as Pam, plus a couple of other leads for him. For example, here these two, because they come from referral. And if I connect as Michael, the manager, I should see every everything, which is the case. So this is a, like a nice addition that we have in, in Green Plum uh, 7. It was kind of possible through uh, the views and things like that, but this is now much more easier to uh, to implement and especially to maintain. So going back to our 
uh, slides. I'm done with the low level security part. There is another feature related to security, which is the PG audit. So this is another extension that we integrated in Greenplum 7, and we also backported it to uh, Greenplum uh, 6. And in this extension, we'll give you the possibility to add more audit logging on the operations that are uh, being executed on your uh, database. So this can be handy for uh, organizations where they have some um, rules to store audit information to, uh, to be compliant with certain laws or things like that. And for this, there are two ways to do the logging of your audit information. Um, it can be on session level uh, auditing. And for that, you will have to define what operations you want to audit through the pgaudit.log parameter. It can be read operations, write operation, functions, roles, uh, DDL operation, and then various other operations like vacuum, for example. You can also have like a more granular approach and only enable logging on certain sensitive objects, certain tables, for example. And this can be done through uh, roles that you define and uh, you grant uh, any operation you want to be um, audited uh, to that particular user. So here, to do this, you have just to create the extension PG Audit. It's already included in, in Greenplum, nothing to be uh, particularly installed uh, for this part. And then you have to configure it. I have two examples. So first example, I am doing um, audit uh, on session level. And for that, I'll be defining the PG audit.log to use read and DDL operations. So any read and DDL should be audited and there will be a log in Greenplum that you can use afterwards by uh, any tool that can read those uh, logs. There are some extensions that you can use for, for that. So here, the read operation, the select that I have in here will be uh, added in the bottom audit session and then you have uh, the query that was executed and at what time. Same for the DDL, the create has been added. The insert was not included in the log simply because I did not precise in my setting that I want to do um, any uh, additional uh, logging on the insert operation. Second example is fairly simple. So here I'm doing an object audit logging. And to do that, you need to define a role in your database that role doesn't need to have any like super user or even login uh, capacity it will only be used as a way to configure pg audit and to grant to that user the operation you want to be logged on your object so here i created a user called auditor i granted uh, everything on my table to auditor and then i set up my pg audit to use that role for auditing so now, whenever I do any operation from insert, update, delete, select on that table, it should be logged inside uh, of my uh, log. Uh, typically, you won't associate this with the other type of logging. So here, it's it has a bit less information, but it will uh, be more targeted to certain objects. So if you don't need to have auditing on everything, you can use this method. Okay, so now let's see some integration uh, improvements in Greenplum. I'm mainly talking about one feature, which is foreign data wrappers. So this is a nice um, standard that can be used to access to external data. So you can query data that is not really stored within your Greenplum, and you can even insert data to that remote uh, data source. Uh, we also have in Greenplum module called PayXF uh, that's used for federation. So that has been there for a while now. You can use that to access data that is stored on like S3 storage on other databases uh, or on Hadoop infrastructure. And now with foreign data wrappers, you can also create uh, foreign tables that will access 
different data sources. And, and one of the cool things we have with the foreign data wrapper is a specific wrapper for Green Plum that is efficient and then can, that can work in a parallel way. Um, so this wrapper will give you the possibility to access to data that is in another Green Plum cluster or another Green Plum database. So this wrapper uh, is called Green Plum FTW. Um, you also call it GP2GP uh, extension. And it's a cool way to share data between different Green Plums. And you will be able to benefit from uh, the parallel execution and the parallel data retrieval. So the segments in your Green Plum will be speaking to the segments of the remote green plum and they can exchange data in a very efficient way that, uh, that way. And you will be also able to do uh, smart processing and push downs whenever possible. So you can give uh, the remote server as much work as possible so that you will reduce the number of data that will be retrieved uh, through the network. So we can do, for example, predicate push down, aggregate push down, and so on. And for this, I have a, a small demo, very simple. So I have my Green Plum database and I have a remote Green Plum database. And basically, what I want is to create a table on my database that will be empty. Basically, it will be a foreign table, and I want to be able to use the data from a remote uh, database as if it was in my cluster. And I want to be able to query that uh, that table without actually having to copy on disk in a real table my, my data. And for that, there are four steps, basically. So you have to enable the extension. You have to create a server and then create a user mapping, meaning since it's a remote server, I need to say which user of the remote server will be used to uh, retrieve uh, that data. And then you create a foreign table. And as soon as you create a foreign table, you can use it as if it was like a real uh, standard table. So let's see this uh, second example. I think now you should be seeing my screen. Uh, so I'm connecting to my database. It is called Demo Bright Talk. So you can see here and here. And first thing I'll be doing is like create a database on my uh, remote database. So I want to, to like generate quickly some data and then insert it in my table, very basic table. Now I'm going to connect to my database and this is where I'll be creating all the components that are needed for my foreign data wrapper. So I will connect first and then I will uh, create the extension. It's already created, but that's why I added if not exists. You can see here I'm connected to the demo bright dog FDW database. I will double check just in case the extension is already there. And now first step, I'll create the server. So this is the server that will be used to access the uh, my database uh, that is on another instance. So here the DB name is Demo Bright Talk and I have to specify the MPP, Massive Parallel Processing Execution uh, Logic. So as I said earlier, we can use um, leverage the possibility of Green Plum to uh, run queries in parallel, since also the data is stored across all the segments. Here I'm choosing all segments options, which means all the segments will be contributing to the retrieval and the execution of the remote queries. So let's create a server. I can double check that it has been created. So there are system tables that enable us to do that. And now I will do the user mapping. So I'm saying you use user DB source on the remote database for the operations that will be run on my foreign table. 
Now let's create the following table. So for that, I'm just creating a table with the classic syntax, but then I'll be adding server, GPFDW server, and then the options, which schema, the remote schema, and which uh, remote table. Okay, that's done. So, okay, now I'll be checking that I have data in my remote server, but there is no table like that on my uh, local server. So connecting to the remote server, Timo Bright Talk, I have 100,000 rows. If I connect to my local database, here we'll see like there is an error because simply that relationship does not exist. And now let's see how the foreign tables work. I'll be connecting to my uh, database. So here, this is where I've defined the foreign table. I'm reading the data from the external uh, source. I'm using limit 10 so that I don't uh, bring everything to my Jupyter notebook. So here we are retrieving the data from my uh, remote server. And what we can do is check the execution plan. And if you see in the execution plan, we have a remote SQL operation here. So we have pushed that query to the remote server and we have retrieved uh, the data locally in a parallel way. And if you can see here, we are using the hidden uh, column, GP segment ID, to double check that we have, uh, we are accessing the different segments of my remote uh, database on the remote table. So here you can see that data is distributed across eight segments, which is the number of segments I have on the remote uh, Greenplum instance. Let's do just a couple of queries before we wrap up. So here I'm doing a select, simple, and then I'm adding a filter ID between 12 and 15. So if I do this, I will be retrieving like four rows, query, and what is even nicer is that if you see the execution plan, you can see that here we have pushed the SQL to the remote server, adding the uh, predicate. So we are doing predicate push down, which means we are only retrieving the four rows that we need uh, through the, the network. Uh, one other way to use uh, foreign tables is to actually insert data into that remote server. So you can not only read, but you can also write on a remote uh, foreign table. For that, I'm here doing, I'm connecting, uh, so double checking that I'm connected to my uh, remote, uh, sorry, my, my database, uh, um, Bright Talk FTW, and I'll be inserting through my foreign table, 123 uh, rows. Let's do that. Okay, cool. And now if I go to my remote database, I want to make sure that those rows have been already added. So you can see here, we have the new rows that were added to the previous one. But of course, you can be in situations where um, you don't want uh, the user to be able to insert records into the remote server. And for that, you can configure your server. You can say you want uh, this, uh, uh, the tables that are used through the server not to be updatable. Once you do that, if you try to do the same operation, it should fail. So here it failed, foreign table does not allow insert. And then just double checking again, we are only seeing the rows that we had previously. Last example, uh, you can of course do joins between local tables and foreign tables. So I am here creating just a simple table that I want to join with my table, I'm doing a simple join on the ID. Here I'm joining my uh, local table that I have just created 
with my remote foreign table. And here you can see that we will be doing the join and we can see that again, here we are trying to do this uh, in parallel and the data comes from the different segments on, on both sides. Okay, so let's go back to our presentation. Next uh, part will be the AI powered search capabilities of uh, Greenplum and over to you, Rizu. Thank you, Shaima. So now I will talk about the new AI powered search capabilities of Greenplum 7. So we know that AI powered solutions are the trend of the moment, especially since last year. But in order to implement such solutions, we need a system that stores and stores vector data and allows efficient search on this vector data. And thanks to the integration of the PG vector extension in Greenplum 7, we are able now to use Greenplum as a massive vector database. So thanks to this new capability, we can implement solutions such as an application to find similar products based on an image photo. We can also build a recommendation system, for example, movie recommendation system based on not only your history, but also you can describe what story you want to watch, what kind of main character you want to watch. And last but not least, we can also use retrieval augmented generation method to build a personalized chatbot based on your private data without the risk of a data leakage. But before talking about how to implement the solutions, let me first explain what vector data is and how to obtain it. Well, originally relational database like Greenplum were designed to store and analyze structured data. But in fact, more than 80% of today's data are unstructured, such as image, text, audio, and so on. So we don't, they don't have a specific structure or format that makes it easy to analyze and, ex and to extract information. But thanks to researchers and data scientists, now we have several pre-trained deep learning models that can generate embeddings or vectors of this unstructured data. And these vectors are numerical representations of, this vec of these objects and contain their contextual and meaningful information. And by using these vectors, we can improve the way we perform tasks such as object recognition, translation, music transcription, etc. And to use them efficiently, we will need to store and index them in a vector database. And in our case, we will use Greenplum 7. And to give a more visual definition of what are embeddings, what are vectors, we can see here two simple examples. So on the left hand, we can see a two-dimensional vector database representing word embeddings on two axes, gender and age. So words with similar meanings are referring to nearby points. So this will allow us to measure semantic meanings between words. You can see grandfather and man are very nearby, and the boy is under uh, the man because boy has an age uh, inferior than the man by definition. And depending on the deep learning models we use to generate these embeddings, we can refer objects to of uh, different types on the same uh, vector, vector space, such as image and text. So you can see on the right hand, we have this image of a dog playing on the grass next to the sentence dog playing on the grass. And based on this uh, 
definition, we are ready to talk about the demo we easily build using Grandform 7 to do a similar research on text and image. So the first demo is a fashion products gallery. We have about 40,000 fashion products information and links to its image stored in Greenplum. So firstly, we can do some data pre-processing in Greenplum, and then we can use PL Python extension to call Python libraries like Sentence Transformer or Hugging Face directly in Greenplum to use the deep learning model we want to generate embeddings on our product image. And here we used the clip model. And this generation will be distributed on different segments thanks to Greenplum's MPP architecture, massively pro parallel processing. And th then thanks to the PG vector extension, we can choose between two types of index for our vector data, IV flat and HNSWV. Both are approximate nearest neighbor search methods. And this index can speed up the semantic search on our vector data. And based on this embeddings, we can easily implement a Python application to search for similar fashion products by providing either an image or by describing the product. And to improve the Python developer experience, we have developed a pandas-like Greenplum library for Python. And thanks to it, Python users can write fully Python syntax, so they don't need to bother with uh, SQL syntax. Now let me show this uh, fashion gallery platform. You can see that we have three options to find a product. The first one will be find by category. So this is the traditional search method. If we have a very general category search, we can use this option. The second one will be more interesting. This one is find by text. So we can give it a description of the product we want to search and it will search in Greenplum uh, thanks to PG vector extension and returns back the results. For example, I want to find white shoes with flowers. It will ask Greenplum to find the similar products thanks to PG vector and returns back. And since the model we are using, the clip model, were trained with English and French. So we can also search with French. For example, I want to find chaussures noir avec des talons, which means black shoes with heels. It can also find the relevant products with this sentence. So this is a multilingual search. And the third option is to find my image. We can either provide an image link or to upload a product's uh, image. For example, here I want to find similar products uh, to this Nike t-shirt. So it can return some relevant results. Now, if we get back to the slides, we can see the second demo. So this demo is also based on semantic search. And this time we want to build a movie recommendation system for the user by providing either the description of the movie or the poster of the movie to find information about it. So this time we have originally about 600 movie information in Greenplum, including release year, title, uh, release company, description, and other textual information, and the link to the poster. And the first step is to do a data pre-processing. So we can use the Greenplum Python library to do some uh, data pre-processing methods as you wrote to drop some duplicates, to drop some redundant data, and it's come to 
about 45,000 movies by the end. And now we can use, uh, we can group all textual information together and to generate uh, text embeddings on this textual information and to generate also image embedding on the poster of this movie. To do so, we can either use two different methods to generate text uh, embedding and image embedding, or we can use the same model as in the first demo, the clip model, to generate embeddings of uh, both types of objects. And then we will follow the same workflow as the demo one. And now we can take a look at so this movie recommendation system. So for this one, we have also three options to find the movie. The first one will be find by movie title. And the second one will be find by description. So for example, here, I want to find some cartoon with animals as character. character. So it returned back some movie recommendation with animals as character. And the third option, so it's also to find by movies poster. And this time I will I will give the image address of the Titanic poster. You can see it can find Titanic itself, even though we don't have the same uh, poster, but based on the content of how this, de this is designed uh, on the info textual information on this poster, it can find Titanic, this movie itself. And at the same time, it can give some recommendation on similar poster with uh, a similar design or with a similar title. Now we can get back to our slides for the third use case, which describe how to combine LLMs with Greenplum to implement retrieval augmented generation with our own private data. Well, to be simple, a LLM is a type of language model able to achieve general proposed language understanding and generation. So LLMs acquire these abilities by using massive amounts of data to learn billions of parameters during training and consuming large computational resource during their training and operation. So it might be complicated for organizations to train their own LLMs. But we can still use some pre-trained models available on networks trained by big companies such as OpenAI or Llama 2. But there is another problem. We know that LLM generally reflect the underlying data they are trained on, which is often incomplete, biased, or outdated. For example, on this slide, uh, we have, uh, if we ask what's Greenplum and what is the largest version of Greenplum to Lama 2, it might answer that the largest version of Greenplum is 6.0 and was released in December 2020, which is obviously out of date. And since it might be complicated or it might raise uh, data leakage concern for some organizations to fine tune models. We propose to implement RAG to improve the answer of LLM with Greenplum. Well, what is a retrieval augmented generation? We can imagine that we have our current Greenplum documentation stored in Greenplum. Well, firstly, we need to generate vector embeddings on these documents. And then when the user asks the API a question, this question is sent to Greenplum to do a semantic search to find the most relevant documentation. And this is uh, what we call the retrieval. 
And then the API will send these documents as context with the user's input to Lama 2. And Lama 2 will take into account all this information and document to generate an answer. And this is what we call the generation. The answer will be then sent back to the user and some feedback could be provided from the user to the models. And now if we ask the same question to our Lama 2 train with uh, RAG, the answer is up to date. You can see that the largest release is Grid from 7, which is released on 28 September 2023. And we can find some uh, new features of Green from 7. So these are three simple AI powered use cases that Green from can implement. You can also imagine other use cases by using tools like LangChain or Lama Index. And we can also combine AI power search with Green Prompt's analytics capabilities, such as the PostGIS for geospatial data. All of this uh, uh, will depends on your imagination and what you want to build. And Green Prompt is here to help you to achieve all these solutions. So now I will hand the microphone back to Bernard. Thank you, Oisu. That's that's really nice and really great feature. Uh, Joe, let, just to, to end that presentation and wrap up tonight, uh, there is much more in Green Plum 7 than what we just presented tonight. But as I always say, Green Plum is a Swiss army knife with a lot of features. And uh, in Green Plum 7, there are many, many new features. So just to do a quick uh, recap of what has been put into Green Plum 7, of course, all the new functions that were in the the post version that we included into Green Plum 7. And uh, I'm just going to mention a few of these capabilities like upsert or transaction in, in procedures or primary case on open optimized table. So that's kind of things that uh, we have now in Green Plum 7. In terms also uh, in of Green Plum specifically, we have improved a lot the manageability of the, the product and uh, the partitioning, for example, has been completely reviewed and improved. Uh, for the DBA and for housekeeping, we have also implemented auto vacuum or auto analyze. We have also um, adapted the uh, alter table and we can do alter table in place now. So that's uh, much uh, easier for, for DBAs. Also for the management of the workload, we have also improved a lot the resource group. There are a lot of new features and a lot of fine tunings you can do with resource group now, including uh, controlling the disk access. Uh, where there is much more control on the CPU or, or on the memory. In terms of security, <coughs> we have already seen few things about role level security and PG audit with Shaima. Uh, there, are, there is also something about advanced password check that we have put into Green Plum 7. For performance, there are a lot of new uh, improvements. Of course, because we are running on a much newer version of Postgres, all the sort and aggregation have, have been greatly improved in Green Plum 7. But we have also very specific features like brain index, Ash index or covering index into Green Plum 7 that are going really to speed up operation. There is also the implementation of C group V2. So that's going to help uh, with the resource group uh, to monitor the performance of your system. In terms of integration, uh, Shaima already uh, uh, disclosed a bit about the, the foreign data wrappers, the GP to GP module, but we have also worked extensively to integrate better other products like RabbitMQ, especially with the Green Plum streaming server. So you can use RabbitMQ much better with uh, Green Plum. In terms of AI and other capabilities, uh, Ruxu mentioned PG Vector, which is really a fantastic add-on into the product, but we have also included PGML that is going to help you for machine learning. In terms of uh, geospatial, we have also integrated a much more recent release of PostGIS 3.3.2. It's not exactly the latest one, but not far away. And we have also included uh, the H3 Geo extension into Greenplum. So, uh, to end up that presentation, 
Green Plum was, was really capable of doing a lot, but it's even better now. So you can manage streaming data, you can manage geospatial, you can manage text search, data science, and in database machine learning. And you can still do a lot about your big data analytics as you were doing before. And the, the big, big feature into Green Plum 7 is the implementation of the vector database capability uh, that Ruxu uh, described today. Uh, this is really a fantastic add-on. And just to remind you, Green Plum 7 is completely software uh, infrastructure agnostic. It can run on any platform. So you can run everywhere with any data type now, any size, and you can run all your workload. That's the end of the presentation. Uh, here are our details, so you can contact us. And uh, let's see if we've got any question for us. No question? We've got a few minutes left if you have any question to ask. Nothing for tonight, apparently. So I'm going to, uh, to say thank you to all of you uh, who attended that call. And uh, there will be a, a next webinar in November to talk to you about other new features into Greenplum. As we were saying, uh, there are many, many new features. It's difficult to put all the new features into just one webinar. It would last, it would last for very, far too long. So uh, let's see you uh, in November for a new webinar. Thank you very much. Thanks, everyone. Great. Thank you.